Congressman um, Christensen, sorry, <laughs> I have to get my head together, our Superintendent Whitney, members of the board and student leaders. Um, I'm excited to be here with a couple of my colleagues to kind of give you a, a report on kind of our efforts around learning acceleration, uh, specifically around summer school. So with no further ado, um, I want to start uh, my presentation by giving some gratitude because um, we couldn't do this without um, all the departments coming together. And I love this quote that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I feel like that that is something that we did this summer. Um, so summer school leads and teachers, we couldn't have done this without teacher leaders that who um, after a long year that they said, okay, yeah, we're gonna do summer school and they showed up and, and led. Um, our nutrition services were um, just spot on to provide food for our kids and we changed some schedules um, to make sure that we could accommodate um, to transportation needs and all of that and they said, okay, yeah, we can do lunch at this time, we'll provide this kind of food. And so they were amazing. And I just wanna give a shout out to our transportation department. Um, they were creating routes until late, like day before school started to make sure that we could have all kids who wanted to attend summer school be transported. And our tech department, we added another layer to summer school of tutor me education, which I'm gonna share some data with you that required Students who didn't have devices, we need to make sure they had one at home. Um, students who had poor internet, they had hotspots, and they showed up and either had centralized locations, um, collected um, laptops and refurbished, and so every kid could actually um, take advantage of tutor me education, so they were a huge help. And our principals, they really leaned in and owned summer school as part of the accelerated learning, and um, so I just want to give a shout out, and my team, um, I know um, Valerie's not here today, but she did a phenomenal job leading elementary summer school as well. Um, so with that, um, we had, we kind of did some visioning. We had two really big goals for our summer accelerated learning opportunity and two strategies. And so I want to start there. We really wanted to provide accelerated learning opportunities for students really based on um, support needs. What I mean by that is that a couple of years ago, as part of the COVID response, we created sort of a rubric, um, like a risk factor of students, not just looking at one data point, but multiple data point, um, and identify students from the highest risk to, and then we sort of rank order. Um, our goal is that we need to show up and serve students who are in highest needs, and so we use that same rubric to identify students that who needed support. And like I said, it's a whole spreadsheet of academic data, um, of multiple academic data points and all of that. Um, we also looked at attendance. We felt that it was an important factor to look at is because if students were struggling to come to school, inviting them to summer school is not always the best strategy. So those students that we wanted to make sure that we provided additional support through one-on-one -on -one tutoring that we had available. Um, the other goal that we had was really focus on setting students up for a successful 2023 school year launch. Um, because our summer school were short, like for elementary and middle, they were two weeks. To really have a robust academic intervention in two weeks is not always, that, that's not unrealistic. Um, so how do we make sure that we find the right um, program um, so they can actually have a better launch to a new school year? So that was two of our goals. Um, a strategy that we really focused on is really to identify and remove barriers for accessing summer school, summer learning, and also to define what's tight and what is loose for equitable access and learning. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit more um, in the next couple of slides. So um, when I'm talking about removing barriers, we kind of brainstorm what are the barriers, why would kids not go to summer school when they're invited? So using this risk factor, we identified students, um, we, we reached out to them, schools did a great job reaching families and you know, inviting them to the summer school. But what would be the barriers for um, students, some of the, the barriers, one of them is two weeks of summer school is not long enough for academic learning acceleration. We knew that going in, when kids come for three hours for two weeks. So our solution to that is that in addition to in-person, we then offered 18 additional hours of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. 18 seems to be a very specific number, but that's actually, if you look at research, high-quality tutoring is two to three hours a week. 
not every day for an hour. So we determined after two weeks of in-person summer school that they would have six weeks of two hour one-on-one -on -one training and then that would really ca carry them through the rest of the summer. So we um, gave them 18 hours. If kid wanted 20, we weren't gonna stop them, right? They could continue on. So they could uh, get one-on-one -on -one tutoring using Tutor Me Education, uh, really by focusing on math and literacy. And our summer school was also, that's part of our outreach outcomes. Another barrier that we identified is students who are unable to, whether they have family vacations during the time that we were offering, um, or whatever the issues are, they have to, you know, take care of the little kiddos, or they, or just simply, I don't, I don't want to do summer school. Some just refuse. Parents say we don't want to. Then those students, or students who had high absenteeism, our solution then was um, to really utilizing that one-on-one -on -one tutoring. You don't need to come to in person, but we want to offer this six weeks of one-on-one -on -one tutoring that you can do from home. Um, so that was our solution. Another barrier was students without computers. Um, our secondary students have one-on-one, -on -one, so they all had computers, but our elementary kids really don't take their laptops home. So that's where our tech department really stepped up and scooped up a bunch of computers, and any kid who wanted to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring at home, we made sure that they had that delivered. Um, and so those were some of the solutions that we came up with. Mark, we also qu defined- Question oh, for you? Yes. Yeah. Is the 18 hours, is that 18 hours total? Like two yeah. hours a week, or? Two hours a week. Two hours a week, so um, most tutoring was an hour long, and so two hours a week for six weeks is kind of how we, that was what was recommended. Giving them 40 hours, it's, they don't follow through on it. So that, and then it's on their own time to schedule, and I'm gonna talk more about the Tutor Me Education, I have some data to show you about how many kids actually took advantage of that. So that, that's why, I know 18 seems really specific, but that's where we landed. That's in addition to the two weeks in person that they got. So we extended the summer school virtually for six more weeks, but with a two hours of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Any other questions about that? Um, so, whoops, need to go back. What's loose and tight, um, the reason that we focus on that is we wanted to make sure that there is some consistency around um, data that we were using as well as offerings. Otherwise, we can't really determine um, effectiveness of the summer school across the system. So there are some of the things that we agreed on. So what's tight is that we're gonna use a, utilize the same consistent data for identifying students. That's that, um, that risk factor data that I was sharing with you that we use the same K-8. So exact same rubric to, to do that in 9-12, it was, we, we decided to really, we need to focus on credit retrieval rather than, so, um, and we'll show some data around that. So that's what we decided to, it was gonna be tight. Um, and also the hours of summer school by grade bands, we wanted to make sure that it was exactly the same. So same number of hours at elementary school, same number of hours at middle school across the board. Um, another thing that we wanted to be tight on is the content and program. So we really narrow the content so elementary schools really focused on same grade level skills, and I'm gonna show you what they worked on. Um, middle schools, um, because we just had them for two weeks, um, we wanted to focus on not, not just the academic skills, but also the soft skills. So, um, and I'm gonna show you some of the examples of that. In high school, what was tight is that it was gonna be focused on credit retrieval, and they did extensive, so the who's credit deficient, and creating opportunity for them to recover credit over the summer, so again, they have a better launch um, at the school year, closer to being on track to graduate. Um, and then we also had a uniform outreach and communication to families, and Anna's department was huge help in getting the word out. Um, we had people like individually call at the schools of families, and so we had the um, consistent outreach to all families. What was loose, however, was some delivery and personalized content. Um, some elementaries with the same hour, they did three weeks, but only three days a week. Uh, some elementaries is four days a week, so there were some variation days in days. Um, and also, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, we didn't, we can't make kids do tutoring. That's one of the things that we learned from Tutor Me Education. You can't force kids. They could take a laptop home and never log on. So we had to really make sure the parents wanted this. 
Um, and many of them, we actually had them log on for the first time, first time while they're in school, so they actually get started. So when they took things home, they were just ready to kind of move forward with tutoring education. Um, the other thing that was loose, that middle school one-on-one, each middle school had a little bit of variation that was geared for their own middle school. So those are some of the things that we're calling loose. So some things we all did it the same, some things that there were some variations based on students and school. So um, Valerie would be presenting this part of it, but I'm gonna do this for her. Um, I'll do justice. Valerie worked really hard and uh, with the elementary principals. So these are the grade level focus. They were really narrowing what they're gonna work on for two weeks. Um, so as you can see, they were all uh, math and ELA focused, but really narrowed um, standards within that. Um, so all the kinder, it didn't matter which elementary school you went to, all the kinder worked on these specific skills. All the first gra graders across the board, they worked on these specific skills. They also did pre and post assessment so we could see growth. Um, use the exact same assessment, again, to see, you know, did what we do for these two weeks make a difference? So as you can see, um, some specific targets. Reason that there, you don't see fifth grade here is because we decided to do something different with fifth graders. Um, so we launched a jumpstart, we called it jumpstart sixth grade. So we actually did fifth grade summer school at their next year's middle school. And that was quite successful. We actually had more kids attend. So incoming sixth graders attend summer school than all the other grades. Um, so that's why you don't see fifth graders. They actually went to summer school in their middle school, next year's middle school, which was something we tried and I think we're gonna do it again next year because it was highly successful. But elementary principals actually helped us reach out to those fifth grade families and then say, hey, you're gonna go to summer school, you're invited to summer school, but you're gonna go to Reynolds or next year's and so they were pretty excited about doing that. Um, some celebrations around elementary um, summer school is that as you can see, you know, we had over 1,300 students who attended and attended regularly we had a really high attendance rate. Um, kids who actually came. Um, and the other celebration is that they could attend the summer school in their own school. So they went to their own school rather than being transported to a school that they don't know. And that was a high priority for principals. So we had summer school at every elementary school. Um, another celebration I mentioned, they had a great attendance. I know Valerie has a, we have a data on every school of who attended, um, their post, uh, pre and post assessment data, we're analyzing that right now. Um, I, again, another shout out to teacher leaders. Our facilitators really stepped up and they were really the summer school lead in providing content and program, which was great. Um, and really majority of the students show growth based on the pre and post. Um, so we're analyzing that and we also wanna track that because one of our goals was not, you know, kind of closing the gap in the summer, but how are they gonna start the school year? And we're gonna track those students' um, academic achievement, like the first grading period, and see did the summer school make a difference? Um, and then look at their fall um, star data and do some comparisons. There's just a lot of data analysis to come. Um, are there any questions about the elementary summer school that I shared with you? questions, you could be done soon, yeah, right? So I'll ask a question here. Yeah. You've got uh, pre and post assessments. Was this during summer school? Mm -hmm. When they came in, you, you did a, yeah. in that two weeks, you did a pre and post assessment, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so the first first day, that was the first thing they did, that we did a pre-assessment. So it's not like a star test because they were really narrowing on that standard, they did a pre-test. And then they focus on that grade level of the skills and then they did a post-test. Um, so we have that data and most of the students made growth. And I know we have the breakdown of by school and so we're analyzing that and principals look at that, yeah. Gotcha. Any other questions about that? Um, so here's middle school and as I mentioned before, um, we had a little over 300 students at 10 middle school, which number doesn't look great overall, depending on how many middle school students that we have. Um, and as a formal middle school, middle school <coughs> kids don't always wanna go to summer school. But what was great about that is that about 60% of that attendance was our incoming sixth graders. 
So Jumpstart 6th grade was a great success, and so we're definitely going to um, really focus on that next summer. <laughs> and um, we used a lot of the Abbott strategies and worked on uh, soft skills, a uh, focus, note-taking, organization, and goal setting, um, really kind of building their relationships and really orientation to school. And they did middle school one-on-one, how they can be a successful middle school student. Um, they also did some social and emotional learning using the character Strong that was embedded into their curriculum as well, as well as um, some academic intervention around literacy and math. Um, sixth through seventh, same thing, they, they focus more on the academic support on literacy and math. One of our ahas was that we had really low attendance in eighth grade, and so we thought, hmm, what if we did jumpstart ninth grade? There might be more buying from eighth graders to actually attend summer school at the high school for the same thing that we did with sixth graders. So that's one of the things that we're going to try to implement next year as well. Um, and the tutoring made available for students for six weeks beyond the two weeks that they were in school. Got another question for you. Yeah. So you, and maybe you said this and I just didn't catch it. So the, you targeted those who were in need of some additional help. I know you'd said that at the beginning that was your focus, but you, you actually invited them and reached out to them and said, hey, but I'm assuming you didn't turn anybody away if they wanted to come, whether they needed help or not. Um, no, I, out of those kids we intentionally invited, but we, what we didn't do was we just didn't open up and say, anybody who wanna come to summer school, come to summer school, because our priority was we wanted to make sure that we had space for those kids that we were targeting. Because our goal was to really the accelerated, accelerated learning for those students that who are high risk. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they had seats, and we staffed. So that, and then we once we had those numbers, and then we had to see staffing to make sure that we had enough teachers at each level. Um, and at our schools were great; they actually shared teachers. Hey, we had six teachers in one of the summer school but we only have this many kids say, can you go teach here? I mean, they did like shifting of teachers to make sure that we met the needs of all the kids who, who said yes to coming. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, and all four of the middle schools were open as well. I, I, yes. I know you'd said the elementary, uh, maybe you meant all of them, but I just, just to confirm. So all yeah. four of the middle schools had summer school as well. We did. Initially, we're gonna like have it at one, but we decided, because that's why Jumpstart, they got to go to their next year's middle school. Sure. So they actually had a head start. So they got to walk the buildings, and so all four middle schools had summer school in their own buildings. Yes, and every elementary did too. What, what percent of students who were invited ended up attending? I'm, you know, Scott, I'm, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, because we had a lot longer list than who actually came, um, but I don't have the percent right now. Maybe just in the Friday update or something? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I could definitely provide that for you. So I'm not just guessing. <laughs> so, that, so compared to previous years, how successful was it? Um, I, because I'm new and I don't have the previous year's experience and or data to, to really compare, I think we did some things differently this year than what we've done in the past. I think targeting certain students but also um, being uniformed in programs. So I really kind of feel like this is kind of a baseline and um, because we had a clear goal that we're gonna actually um, build on for future summer school. I don't know if, you know, Michelle, if there's something you wanna add to that, but yeah. Was summer school more open to everybody in the past? Because we did have like STEM education and... We, we actually, when, at elementary, we did have WC STEM camp this year. Um, we had, um, I can't remember exactly, we had a handful of kids who actually attended it, so we did have that at elementary. <coughs> okay. yeah. yeah, I love this. I love, I love that it helps. I mean, I don't have any problem giving it to the kids that are academically behind. Um, I hope it's all kids that are academically behind, not just disadvantaged or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so I shouldn't say disadvantaged, um, higher poverty or, I, I don't want to, I don't want to narrow in on one demographic. I want to help any of our kids that need help. Yeah. So that's probably what that went towards. That's what we're doing. Yeah, this is great. I think it's a great. I also love that you call it jumpstart sixth grade. And there's a lot of anxiety. And there's also, I mean, I've done some research and there's a, there's a drop 
in achievement between between middle school, elementary school, and middle school, and there's another drop of the degree between um, middle school and high school. So just that transition is hard for these kids. So by saying jump start ninth grade, you're saying, come on, let's show you around, you can get to know the school. I just think that's fantastic. So great way to help um, alleviate fears and and hopefully help help alleviate that achievement drop when kids know where to go, what they're doing, and, and then have more skills to even be more confident in what they're doing. So I, this was, that's wonderful. So you might have said it on one of the first slides, how do you define who got to come? Anybody who wasn't performing on grade level for English and math, or was did you did the teachers have the ability to go in and say they're not, they don't grasp these standards and that you had defined ahead of time? How did you define who you invited? We actually used, um, it's kind of a, it's called a risk factor. And it's a, it's a database. So it's not just one achievement data, but we looked at multiple of academic data. We looked at, we do look at their demographics, um, attendance, it wasn't just one data. And so we pull that together and Mark actually pulls it for us. And then so we get a list of kids and based on, and they sort of get a score based on that we call it a risk factor. And then we rank order. Kids were most at risk all the way down to, and then we went, so we looked at from kids at most at risk. Um, we could accommodate, you know, we have six summer school teachers. That means that we could have, you know, 180 kids. So we go from rank one all the way to 180, and they were the first ones to get invited. And if any of those kids said no, or families that were out of town, then we would go to the next five. We invite, so we literally focused on, so it's not subjective. Um, one thing about teachers doesn't say, oh, so-and-so is, is a new summer school, based on what? So we wanted to make sure that it, we were consistent in identifying students who needed the support. So did they find, so risk factors, English as a second language, poverty, other things. Did, you, did they find that any, and, and let's go to kindergarten, simple things like sight words and whatever else you had there, that some of the kids with higher risk factors already knew all their sight, wor performed really high on those incoming tests, or was that risk factor a good screening for those that performed well at all of these, or sorry, those that performed low at all of these standards coming in? Um, the risk factors show that they were below where they need to be. Um, what I can do is that I can share with you. What I didn't want to do here is share everybody what they were. You know, kids who attended summer school, what I didn't want to say, oh, I was high risk and these, are the, you know, I, that's why I didn't call it out here. Yeah. Um, but I'll be happy to share with you what specific data point that we looked at and it's a spreadsheet this wide. So it's not just one point, but we're looking at the whole child of their need. No, I guess m I was asked, I don't need to see the whole spreadsheet, just more at a high level, could kids score low on your risk factors and then come in and still perform decently on these standards coming in? Maybe a Did the process of identification <coughs> yield you the right kids in summer school? When the kids got there and you did your pretest, were you like, these are the kids that need to be here? Or were you like, oh, these kids blew this out of the water, they don't need to be here? Yeah. Nobody blew it out of the water. Um, and so, but they all made growth. And here's a, the other thing that we're looking at, Scott, is that we measure our success, not what happened in two weeks, but we're gonna, we have names of all those kids who attended. We wanna kinda track how they did, and we're gonna look at them at first grading period. To me, that that's the success of summer school, is that how they did the first quarter or first trimester of their school. Because our goal is to set them up for success. Because historically, when kids take three months off, they usually take a dip, they forget a lot of things. So that's why we wanted to offer this ongoing tutoring. So our data tracking, we're not done yet. We have pre and post for two weeks, but we're also gonna look at after the first grading period, first trimester to see how they were doing. Did the summer school really help them? I hope that answers some of your were questions. Were you able to help everyone? Because I would look at this, I would be really grateful if I could help our kids that were scoring in the bottom 30% or the bottom 40% or the bottom 50%. I don't know what what you what you would, you know, designate. Were we able to help all of 
of those kids, or was there a line that we got to and we were like, oh, we missed, we missed this much that that we could have helped these kids? To be to be transparent, Amy, we we had to draw a line just based on the staffing, like I was describing right, to right. you. Right. There were a lot more kids we could have, um, and I'm hoping that changes next year, because that to me that that's a that's a COVID impact. We had a lot more kids in in that risk index than we would have. I'm hoping next year that will shrink because we focus on core, um, just like things that were our goals are this year is all about core instruction and tier one instruction. Next year, we're going to use the exact same index. Hopefully, that number will shrink. If we're not, then we're not doing our job right during the school year. So um, that's part of that. I think we're developing a system this year. Every summer, we're going to use the same index. Otherwise, we're comparing apples and orange. No, so, I'm, and I'm gr grateful that yeah. you are going to, and I understand the staffing. Yeah, we would have loved to have served this all. many kids, but we were only able to serve this many kids. And hopefully, next year, yeah. we'll be able to serve all of the kids in need regardless of what their risk whatever if they're scoring this far below we will be able to to offer them this this help so I, I mean I think that's great and hopefully it really helps us move the needle and help every 100% of every one of our children to succeed in school right and um, I'm gonna Jennifer I'm gonna have Jennifer talk about high school summer school and then I'll come back with some of the next steps I think So um, this year in high school, we took a little bit uh, different uh, approach with how we offered summer school. So this year we used our Edgenuity online platform that we use for IPAL for all, pretty much all of our summer school uh, programs. So every, so any student who was behind in credits was given the opportunity to attend summer school and recover credits that they might have been deficient throughout the last few years. So you can see uh, we have, we actually enrolled a grand total of 914 high schoolers, nine, grades nine through 12 in summer school. And this was all three schools. So we brought all of our summer school for high school um, in one location at Pasco High. And so all of our students came to Pasco High, all of our teachers were at Pasco High, counselors, um, we had an administrator. So we ran all three of our schools at Pasco High. 914 high schoolers uh, attended or were registered. Um, of that, those students recovered 187.5 credits or 375 classes. So um, it's not quite, quite where we wanted it to be, but I will tell you that's the most credits we've ever recovered in summer school. So even though we think like, oh my gosh, there was 914 students and we got 375 classes passed, that's much higher than we've ever um, retrieved credits in summer school. So we are happy about that. What is really excellent though, is that those IPAL or Edgenuity classes are, are open for the entire year. So all of those students that are registered still need those credits to graduate. So each school is putting a plan in place about how to recover those credits for those students who still, um, that difference between 914 and 375. So all of those students have been forwarded back to their original high school and each high school is developing a plan of how to continue that work, whether it's like seventh hour, whether they're running a lab, whether students are just going to be doing it at home and they're gonna follow up. But our goal is that all of those 914 students will recover that credit by the end of the school year. So that was uh, much different. We did also run um, for some of our, uh, our L1 or newcomer students who are still learning English. We ran um, some in-person summer school for them. And also for some of our students who are on IEPs we ran some in-school or in-person uh, summer school course. Like we had a couple of teachers who are working with those students um, because we didn't feel like that online um, platform would be the best for either one of those particular groups of students. So uh, over the course, we, so we are pretty excited about the 187.5 credits that we did recover. 
um, and obviously hoping it's about four or 500 by the end of the school year. What, <coughs> what does credit recovery mean? Like what, means does it mean they didn't attend enough? They failed their courses? It, it means they didn't pass their course the first time they took it. And to recover a credit, what is, in, in a short summary, what does that entail? Does it entail taking assignments that you missed and redoing them? Does it ta entail proving that you know some certain key concepts? So this is the beauty of the Edgenuity credit retrieval uh, software is when a student, so let's say I took Algebra 1 and I didn't pass Algebra 1. So when I get signed up for my Algebra 1 class on Edgenuity, I go in and take a pretest. And then it, it determines which standards I don't still don't know and I only have to work on those standards. So as soon as I show that I know all the standards, then I retrieve credit. So it could be like if I, like we could have five kids taking Algebra 1 and maybe I only am missing two standards. So I only have to do the work on those two standards because I've already demonstrated competency in the other. And maybe my neighbor, they, they have a little bit more, right? So it might take them a little longer. So it's really personalized about what that individual student knows and then they have to make up that difference, which is why it's not a brand new course. So all of every course students took was a course that they've already not been successful in. So what kind of, so you said that we, we fail the course, we go recover it. Do you get a grade for that? Do you get no yes. grade for that? Can you go from an F to an A yes. by recovery? So yes, so when you get, when you, the Edgenuity would give you a grade, they just like any other course. And so when that grade gets transcripted, that grade replaces the previous grade. It's just for those who fail. Yes. <clears throat> so you could have kids that went through the whole semester or trimester, got a C or a D, and they keep their grade, but those who fail can come and change their grade to an A? Yes. Yeah, this is great. I love that you assess what kids already know because why reteach, you know, <laughs> why reinvent the wheel? Why reteach what they already know? I think that's wonderful. Um, I've had kids in Edgenuity um, and in help um, my daughter through Edgenuity and because of the weird way and something that I would love to change a hundred times over and I'm not the only parent is that Algebra 1 is Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 is Algebra 2. So I put her in Algebra 2 thinking she's getting Algebra 2, not the second year of Algebra 1. So in that, I am I have taught Algebra and Algebra 2, so Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 and Algebra 3 and Algebra 4, I guess, in Pasco School District terminology, many times. And I honestly thought I was teaching her Algebra 2. Edgenuity is extremely rigorous. Mm -hmm. So is that, how did our kids do with that? It's online learning, it's extremely rigorous, and and I mean, my highly capable child struggled with some of the, yeah. the things with it. So how, how does that work with kids that are struggling? Yeah, and so one of the things I neglected to mention is that kids came to Pasco High. So we had teachers, even though it was online, so if I needed a math class, I was in a math lab with a, a math teacher so that they could support the learning. So it ran three days a week for six weeks. And so students were, students were supposed to be coming. Some students were just doing it at home and if they were doing it at home and not coming, we weren't penalizing them. But the, the, the design was that they were coming there because we knew that they would need support. Right, so we had an English lab, a science lab, a, a math lab, a social studies lab. So like if I'm a math teacher, I would have kids maybe doing algebra one, algebra two, geom. I could have kids doing a number of different classes because they were on the computer, but if they needed assistance, we made sure that we had teachers in those lab classrooms to support that. So, and you're right, it's not perfect because it's unfortunately not, there's not going to be any software program that's gonna teach exactly what we taught in the, in our Pasco High, like Algebra One class, right? So it's based on national standards, it's based on common core standards. Um, and so hopefully 
uh, it helps students recover those pieces. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not something that, oh, I'll just sit down and do this and it'll be a piece of cake and then I'll get my credit. And then the last thing I wanna say is all of the assessments had to be proctored. So students had to come in to take the assessments so they couldn't take the assessments at home. They could work on their schoolwork at home, like their lessons, but they had to actually be um, with a teacher to do the assessments. Well, I'm very grateful that, and I'm gonna call our ELT something that I actually learned in AVID, our emerging bilingual and our, um, and our SED suites were both in a classroom with a teacher because after sweet ingenuity, I would never have posted in engineering. So I think that's fantastic. So I'm glad that you did that. Um, and you know, this looks incredibly successful. 187 credits is twice that many um, classes because each credit, mm -hmm. each class is worth 0.5 right. credits, right? So that's, I think that's fantastic. So that's really successful and hopefully you do very well in that. That was a great idea for an engineering class to have. Can a student, let's say a student had just struggled for whatever reason go back to your algebra one and they got a C or a D and they thought, well, maybe I didn't quite earn that. Can they opt in to this? And, and they're not gonna get a credit that they didn't have before, but it could still help them learn the standard better, it sounds like, if we believe that it's helping students learn standards. Can they opt in at this point? Yeah, I think that we could um, definitely, if we have students that wanna do that, we, we have a full site license to Edgenuity so we use Edgenuity for their full courses and some of their credit retrieval courses in IPAL. So yeah, we could do that. Like if I got a C, like I think about in college, like I remember I got like a C minus in pre-calculus and I didn't want that grade on my um, transcript, right? So I went and retook the class so I could get a better grade. I think that that would be an opportunity uh, if we had kids that wanted to do it. I don't see anything that would prevent us from doing that. It's not what we were focused on, because you can right. see we had 900, well, we had um, 912 students that had failed a class that needed a class to graduate. And these are all classes that are required for graduation. Right. Um, so I don't think anything would stop us from doing that. But in the future, that. these students probably don't know about that right now, because we're not marketing that way. And I'm not just saying just to get their grade point average up, but some might argue that if you got a C minus or a a D minus, you got a credit, but maybe you don't quite understand the the principles to move on to the next class and really be successful. So sure. just something for us to think about. How do we use it? Not, not to raise your GPA, but if we believe it's really teaching standards and helping them catch up, those who get low C's and D's or wherever the district decides to cut off could probably benefit from it as well. Yeah, and I certainly don't want a hundred and, or excuse me, 30 valedictorian because if we opened it up too much, we could end up with 30 valedictorians as everybody makes up their A minus grade, which clearly shows that, you know, that they're proficient, but they don't need to go beyond that, so. Yeah, and I think that some of what you're talking about as far as like mm -hmm. learning the standards, we have flexible intervention and, and enhancement time. So if we feel at both of our high schools, and, or not both, all three of our high schools, and um, all four of our middle schools have a time, like if the teacher feels like, wow, you didn't perform very well on that standard and that's a priority Boulder standard, we're gonna give you some extra support on that standard. And hopefully, <laughs> I know we have a standards-based grading going on that, that allows kids to replace grades and do some of that within the regular classroom if they can show that. So hopefully those kind of pieces are in place Scott, but I do think it could be something if it was like somebody really wanted to do that, but I could also see what Amy's talking about being a 15 year high school principal where like I have an A minus and I want an A, so I have a four point. And, and I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not proposing this but, yeah. to increase our grades, but again, I'm proposing that, that if you slipped by with a D or a D minus, yes. you probably are as at risk as the person who got an F and didn't get a credit, but we're That's cutting right. it off yeah. at the F because we're counting credits versus right. saying, who really needs this? And if we really believe in this program and that it's really helping these kids learn the standards, not just retrieve a credit, then where's the right spot to draw the line? Just posing that theoretical question. For sure. Good stuff. 
Yep. So Any uh, other questions? Yeah, just oh. so just w I want to make sure I'm clear. I think you said they were six weeks in uh, in uh, high school, summer school. So in six weeks, then 375. I'm assuming each student just took one class. Each student was registered for two. Which is why it shows that there's still 1,400 classes. Uh, so 912 kids registered for like 1,412 plus 375. So most kids are registered for two classes. Some finished one, didn't finish one. Some finished both of them. Um, and it, so that's how we did it. So we, it was like a four hour, three and a half hour time. So they would work on two different classes, have two different teachers during that time. So 914 students finished 375 classes. Most of them signed up for two. Half a, are all the classes half a credit? Yes. Regardless of what it is. Yes. English, math, whatever. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank all you. All right. Thank you. So last little bit that I want to share with you is because um, we're all about innovation. Um, I know. Um, I presented to you about tutoring education that we wanted to try this out this summer. So we learned quite a bit. Um, so I have Megan here who's actually gonna, has taken over tutoring education. She's gonna be key person to develop how we're gonna utilize this resource throughout the year. Kind of going back to some of the questions, Scott, that you're saying, we don't really want students to wait until they actually get the final grade to know they haven't learned the standards. The best case scenario is we're intervening throughout so they, when they are finished with the course, like it's not about the grade, but they're meeting the standard. I think tutoring education would be a great resources th during the school year to do exactly that because it works similar to Edgenuity. It's based on they do a pre-assessment around the standard and identify which standards that students need to work on and then they get one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So um, this is our summer, summer tutoring access. Um, so we have you know almost 2,000 hours completed of tutoring and we have 207 schedule, which that means similar to what Jennifer said, we have students who are still finishing it up because we gave them up to 18 to 20 hours that they could get tutoring. So there we have, I'm gonna show you this week's schedule of how many kids are still getting tutoring. We didn't put an end date on this. It's like, you know, you, you have six weeks to, um, to get 20 hours of tutoring. You can work on your family schedule um, whenever you want to. So that's kind of how we use this. And um, what was great about it is that I know you can't really see this very well and I blocked out students' name because we're learning the tutor me education and all the, what they provide for us. So every student and family gets like a progress report like this. It is pretty detailed of what, what the pre-assessment is. I know you can't see it. There's a score for the pre-assessment. This student got 65%, 13 out of 20 on the standards that they were tested on. Um, we gave them kind of the criteria for focus on literacy and math because that's what we were working on in summer school. They could do other things, but those are the two areas that they focused on. It was offered K-8, so you, you'd be surprised how many kindergartners had a tutoring, um, which I think is fascinating, and as well as our middle school students. And it shared, it actually talks about what they're working on, what progress they're working on, and then this report goes to the student and the family. Um, and so this is what I was talking about. This was this week's tutoring. I know it looks crazy, but when I go to the calendar dashboard, this is what I see. This is for me, every student that who is actually registered for a tutoring, one hour tutoring. And when I click on a student, like I'm click on this little kiddo who actually did tutoring on a Sunday. <coughs> um, I click on it as this student is from uh, Franklin STEM and it has a name and had a 30 minute tutoring session in a Sunday afternoon. Um, there's another student from Maya Angelo who had a one hour one on one tutoring at from 7 to 8 p.m. So this gives a full schedule and that's one of the things that we wanted. I think this would be a great resource for us. We're really extending the school hour without extending the teacher hour. Um, so we are cre we're in the process of developing a kind of robust program to make this available as part of the extended learning during the school year. So Megan, is there anything you want to add about that? about tutor me education? Just that we have families. You wanna come, you gotta come yeah. up here. <laughs> Just that we have families who are already asking for more time. So there's the, a high interest in this and that's, that's fantastic. And the team working with tutor me ed, they're really, they're great. They're really informative and helpful. <coughs> so students can get tutoring in English or we have Spanish tutors um, or we've asked for 
um, actually Russian tutors as well, so they can get tutoring um, in those languages. So there were six weeks that this tutoring was available, and we extended it? In no, we gave them hours. So, so you have 18 to 20 as our tutoring. You can use it within six to eight weeks during the summertime. Um, that it fits your schedule. And so we did the math, about two, two one-hour sessions per week. And then we, you have six weeks or eight weeks to complete it, where some students are still going. And some families ask me for more hours mm -hmm. because they've already done their 20 hours. Mm -hmm. are, are we going to continue with these activities? Yeah, we, we signed the contract last year for one year. Um, we wanted to, kind of like the Hazel Health, we wanted to launch it this summer, see how it goes. We sort of develop and really targeting students who is at highest risk and to see what progress they make. Um, and then we would expand that to doing the school year support as well as part of the, our MTSS, multi-tier system of support. It should fit into that for academic intervention. Um, that it really pushes the school hours beyond the school hours. So basically we can use it all year. All, all year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we signed a contract, we actually signed a contract for 10,000 hours. We use about 2,000 of that this summer. So we have 8,000 hours that we can distribute to the schools, but it's gonna be based on need. We're not just gonna say, all oh, school gets so many hours. Well, the needs are different. Mm -hmm. um, and the school can use that as an extent. It's not gonna replace during the school. That's one of the things we're gonna be clear about. Kids should not attend tutoring while they're in school. It could be part of the extended learning after school or like we are doing here, but it cannot replace a core instruction. We're going to be very clear about that. So I think it's fantastic. So I have I have tutored well over eight hundred kids in my life. I've done a lot of tutoring, and it is amazing what a child can do, especially a child who wants to be there mm -hmm. and do with that child. So I think it's fantastic. Um. So kind of next steps, and then I can um, entertain some more questions that you might have. So what's next? So we're gonna engage in plan, do, study, adjust. Um, so we had a plan, we executed the plan, now we're studying the data. I share some of that with you. We have more data to unpack. Um, and then we're gonna make some adjustments, not only for the school year, so we have less kids who need summer school, that's our goal next year. How great it would be that we can offer summer school not only for students that who need it, but students that who want to, right? We're gonna get to that point. Um, we've did some lessons learned this summer. Um, things that it was success, we're gonna build on it. Things that, it, you know, that lessons learned that we're gonna do differently. So um, we're gonna track, and I already mentioned this, student progress throughout the school year who attended summer school, so we're not done looking at how they're doing. Um, we're gonna collect and analyze some additional data who attended summer school, even though we didn't use star data for pre and post, but we're gonna look at fall star, their attendance data and GPA, all those things. Um, throughout the school year. Um, what, as I just mentioned, we wanna really develop the systems of this one-on-one -on -one tutoring this year so it truly becomes an extended learning opportunity for um, our students. Um, and really envision summer school and have clear goal um, for next summer looking ahead, like growing our Jumpstart sixth grade, potentially adding Jumpstart ninth grade, kind of looking at the success of that, why not um, consider that. We also talked about by staggering summer school start time, it's gonna help with the one transportation, but also middle school kids, I think more kids would have come if we didn't have summer school till one o'clock because they were all sleeping in the morning rather than 8 a.m. Um, so we're gonna make some of those adjustments to make sure that more students who need summer school that they can access it. So those are some of the lessons learned and next steps. So that, is the end of our presentation. Um, are there any additional questions, comments for our team? Thank you, Ms. Goebel. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. And thank you to all the staff that, that worked to help these students this summer. And then uh, we'll just open up to the board for any additional questions. I just wanna make a comment. I think this is phenomenal, just phenomenal. I mean, um, huge step in, in giving our kids what they need to is what I think our board has been about from day one. I, I want every child who has any need to be able to, to access summer school. So, and I realize that that's a lot of teachers and it's their summer and all of that. But 
I hope we can get there. Even maybe pull some retired teachers out that might be willing to do that because they are sometimes a wealth. Sometimes they're a little burned out, but sometimes they are a wealth of, of knowledge and, and help there. So anyway, I, I just, I love this. I want to continue with it. I want to see how it goes. I am thrilled that you're going to be tracking this because if we are doing things that aren't helping, then we need to stop doing them. So I am thrilled that you're tracking this, and I just think this is a great opportunity for our kids. It seems like it can be nothing but successful from the outside in. So let's see what shows up from the inside out. So thank you. I, I love it too. Um, I think opportunities have to be seized in, of the time of the opportunity. Yeah. So we're giving the kids an opportunity to succeed. Um, not only in academically, but for the future as well. So I'm very excited about it, and it looks like the retrieval program is really awesome. And uh, so really excited about it, and good job to all your team. Any other questions from students? No additional questions? All right, well, thank you again. Thank you to those who joined us this afternoon. Um, please join